Welcome to a special edition of Savage Marriage with Phil and Priscilla. And I'm Phil. And I'm Priscilla. You'll be listening to Phil and I read our award-winning book, Savage Marriage, Triumph Over Betrayal and Sexual Addiction. We're releasing the audio version of our book for free, chapter by chapter, every few weeks on this podcast. If you've benefited from our ministry, share this podcast with someone else. You'll be glad you did. And here we go. Chapter 4, Unlocking the Door to Forgiveness. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 Forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hatred. It is a power that breaks the chains of bitterness and the shackles of selfishness. Corey Tenboom. I relaxed as Phil pulled away from the airport drop-off. Glad I didn't have to be around him for four days. I made my way through the airport security and later found my seat on the plane. Thank you, Lord. Nobody is beside me. I just wanted space and to be left alone. As I sat in complete silence, I felt almost comatose. Phil's revelations had left me numb. I wanted to curl up, fall asleep, and not wake up again. But questions about him kept my thoughts running in circles, prickling my mind, and sending sleep far away. I had never been to a women's retreat where I didn't know a single person— but I was thankful I wouldn't have to make small talk or share what had happened five days ago. I could just listen to the speaker and take notes on how to fix Phil once and for all. I decided to make a list of questions to ask Jenny Speed, hopeful her answers would be the checklist to fix my husband and free me from the mess I was in. I boarded a van with six other women for the two-hour ride into the mountains of North Georgia. Our driver, Lisa, welcomed us to Four Days to Hope. She was kind, and her smile was genuine, as if she had also experienced the heaviness we each carried. Most of us sat in silence, nursing downcast faces that showed our inner turmoil and pain. Once inside the rustic cabins and throughout dinner, we did what most do— We made superficial chit-chat and awaited the first evening session with anticipation. Jenny Speed was a petite, slender woman with soft brown hair and eyes. She had an athletic build and was wearing jeans in a blue top emblazoned with whatever it takes, the name of her ministry. Her deep Southern accent was paired with a New Yorker badass attitude, but her contagious laugh and unpretentious style made it easier to let our guards down. After her brief welcome, the leaders each shared what had brought them to Four Days to Hope many years ago. Some stories were similar to mine and others totally different. The common chord that united us all was pain. Their sharing set a tone of transparency. We were listening intently, seated on couches and overstuffed chairs, when Jenny suddenly directed her attention to us. Ladies, there's a reason why you're here at Hope. Tonight, we want to hear from you. How did you hear of Four Days to Hope, and what brought you here? Thick silence enveloped the room, as if the air had been sucked out. We all looked down and avoided eye contact. No one wanted to go first. Jenny patiently ignored the silence and simply waited. It was broken by the woman sitting next to me. All eyes in the room pulled toward us as she shared. Her story was one I'd never forget. I was a prostitute, pimped out at the age of 13 by my mom. I was addicted to drugs and eventually became a pusher. I was made to do things I never imagined. Then Jesus came into my life and set me free. Her soft smile pulled oxygen back into the room, and we all seemed to take in a collective breath. Now I'm back on the streets, but I peddled Jesus instead of drugs. We smiled, and her lips tightened into a thin line as she continued. I started a ministry for hookers, but now my husband is messing around with them. She described the incredible pain she felt as her husband had pursued the very women she was ministering to. Her pain connected with mine, and I felt united with her and other women, my sisters of sorrow. Thank you for sharing, Jenny said. We're glad you are here. 
She looked around the room and asked, who's next? My heart pounded and my chest burned. I hadn't come to a retreat to share. I wanted to keep my pain hidden and simply learn. It quickly became apparent that there was no place to hide at this retreat. It was a place for revealing and I would have to speak. Why not? My story is no worse than hers. I slowly raised my hand and volunteered to share. Through my tears and sobbing, I spewed all the details of what had happened only five days prior. My anguish hemorrhaged over Phil's betrayal. Jenny studied my face as I shared, and when it was clear that nothing was lingering inside me, she said, I'm glad you're here. We've never had a woman come to hope as early as five days after her husband disclosed his infidelity. You're the first, and you're at the right place. This weekend's for you. Still reeling from my boo-hooing, snot-running, Kleenex-swabbing testimony, I was comforted by her genuine words, which helped me catch my breath. I never cried so much in front of strangers. All the women there had gone through something similar and felt the pain of betrayal, abandonment, unforgiveness, abuse, or other deep wounds. We were sisters in crisis, and I felt compassion without judgment. I was glad I had come. Each woman shared heart-wrenching stories of why they were there. Everyone was in a real mess, and I felt relieved that I wasn't alone in my desperate situation. After almost two hours, we took a 10-minute break. I went to my room. I turned off my phone, not wanting to be distracted, and decided to send Phil a text. This is an amazing retreat, like nothing I've ever been to before. These women are real, and I'm glad I'm here. Priscilla's text was a fresh injection of hope, letting me know the retreat wasn't just another women's retreat of games, spa appointments, and laughter. She was a bottom-line person, and her message meant something truly out of the ordinary was happening. For the first time since coming clean, I was alone at home. In the past, I'd look for new massage parlors, even on the way home from the airport, so I could later research them on the internet. Then, I'd quickly eat dinner with the kids and go to my office to look at porn. But this time, pain consumed my entire soul, and there was no room for lust. I had no sexual desire. All I wanted was reconciliation with Priscilla and a clear word from God about the way forward. That was it. I no longer cared about my career, reputation, or money. I wanted only healing and restoration. The next morning, Jenny rounded us up. Come on in, ladies. Get your coffee, water, bring your notebook, and take a seat. We've got work to do. She spoke with confidence tinged with jest. She was the main speaker for the session, and her gentle yet straightforward approach intrigued me. She was so natural and seemed to like her own skin. She was not there to put on a show. She was just real, down to earth, like she was saying, I'm not afraid to be me. As she spoke, it was as if she could read my thoughts, and I wondered, how could she know me so well? Jenny described the five stages of trauma, denial, anger, grief, fear, and healing, providing examples of how she and Paul had worked through each stage. She paused, looking around the room. Ladies, what stage are you in? Are you stuck in a stage? Are you in the whirlpool of all the stages? For the first time, I saw myself in the whirlpool of emotions, stuck since 16,000 movies confession 18 years ago. I had fluctuated between anger, grief, and fear, and had shut down my emotional connection with Phil to cope with my pain. I had focused on self-protection and keeping my mask on so no one could really know me. Anger had been my life, my reality, my go-to reaction when the least little thing hadn't worked out right. Rather than addressing my anger, I had tried to hide it and pretend it wasn't there. My pain was now banging on the door of my heart, screaming for healing from my grief. The weight of unresolved grief was dreadful, and my fear that Phil would return to porn was continually in front of me, trapping me in hopelessness and despair. But as I sat there, facing it all, the whirlpool felt even worse because the situation in our marriage was no longer just porn. It was a whole double life of immorality. 
All my emotions felt constantly bundled up in the washer of life, permanently set on one never-changing cycle, perpetual agitation. As the load churned into day-to-day life, each emotion would erratically surface. I was stuck in unresolved trauma and had kept the washer lid shut tight, but Jenny had just opened the cover, and I was now seeing the full load of our swirling, dirty laundry. How could I have been so blind to this for 18 years? Jenny acknowledged that some of us were probably struggling to see past our current trauma, and she encouraged us to ask Holy Spirit to reveal the wounds from deeper in our pasts. I closed the lid to my present crisis and asked Holy Spirit to show me my past wounds and lies I believed. I remember the impact of rejection from my siblings, including the manure fight. I had never felt accepted or included, and I believed this lie. You don't belong in the family. No one wants you, and you are not one of them. I didn't understand how my parents had ignored my siblings' verbal abuse against me. They hadn't protected me, which had made me feel unworthy, unloved, of no value, with no sense of belonging. I also remember teachers who had made me feel stupid and bullies who had beat me up. I had wanted someone to stand up for me, and not even my parents had seemed to care. Never before had I contemplated so clearly and directly my past wounds. Jesus was shining his spotlight on my heart to help me see beyond all the shadows. My entire life, not just the past 18 years, had been a whirlpool of never-ceasing emotion cycling randomly to the surface and back into the deep without ever moving into the next stage true, healthy healing. My wounds had remained buried, never healed because I'd shut the lid and not opened it. Jenny asked us to do a simple exercise. Think about who you place your trust in, God or man. Then personalize Jeremiah 17, 5 through 6. The blue ink in my workbook screamed at me. Priscilla had trusted in Phil. Curse it is Priscilla who trusts in Phil and makes Phil her strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. She is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. She shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. I had never before seen how much I made Phil my God, counselor, fixer of all things, provider, friend, and lover of my soul. I wholly misplaced my trust such a long time ago, beginning with my earthly father. He hadn't fully protected me as a young woman, and I had trusted in him rather than my heavenly father. Now, after all these years of marriage, I was seeing how I had clung to Phil instead of Jesus. I had placed all my hope and trust in a man, when all my hope and trust should have been only in Jesus, the true lover of my soul, my true friend and father. It was no wonder I'd held on to so many disappointments in our marriage. No wonder the chasm between Phil and me and me and God had continued to grow. No man could have ever lived up to my needs and expectations of him as my God. I was also seeing my idolatry for the first time. I had erected more than one God, and none of them was my creator, the living God. I continued looking at Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. Blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when he comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. God's words, written so long ago, now poke through my whirlpool of emotions giving me a spiritual clarity of each piece of laundry in the load, a true revelation. While the dirty water churned endlessly inside of me, I felt parched dwelling in the wilderness like a tumbleweed with no root, no life, no living water, blown at will by the scorching breath of the enemy of my soul across the vast desert of life, all because I had trusted in earthly men since birth instead of being rooted and watered by Jesus. I longed to be the strong, flourishing tree rooted beside the beautiful stream, bearing fruit in every season, 
with no fear of drought or heat that life inevitably brings. For all those years, I had misplaced my trust. I had been the one in the wrong. Jesus had not been my first and only love. I, too, had been unfaithful to my Heavenly Father. My misplaced trust was now so clear to me, even as I grappled with the shattered marriage and my lost dreams of living happily ever after and growing old with Phil. Everything was now a heap of oozing filth and produced nothingness. Lord Jesus, what have I done? I've rejected you for so long. With the light of truth piercing my heart, showing me the facts of my problems, my cocoon of numbness and protection began to dissolve. In the midst of my reflection, I was jarred by the gentle voice inside me. Priscilla, I didn't bring you here to fix Phil. I brought you here to fix you. That was the first time I heard God's voice so clearly. His words were clear and soft and true. I needed Jesus. I needed to be well, to be healed by him. His words held me so tightly I couldn't move. In awe and brokenness, I sat there thinking, that was God speaking to me, and he really does love me. I was stunned for a few minutes by what I had just experienced. My entire reason for going to Hope had been to fix Phil, but God's entire reason for me being there was to fix me. He was pursuing my healing just like he was pursuing Phil's healing. Yes, the pain of Phil's betrayal was real, but the power of God's voice opening my eyes and heart to his love for me was overwhelming. I had often heard people read God's word, but hearing God's voice directly inside me from his word and spirit was the beginning of my healing. The next morning, Jenny began with a session on forgiveness. I had always thought forgiveness was more like forgetting and putting the offense in the past. Forgive and forget. The problem with my thinking was that all the ugly emotions and the pain quickly surfaced whenever a past offense was brought up, which meant I hadn't actually forgiven. My response to forgiving had been to stuff offenses in an overfilled broken laundry tub, and my effort to forget them had been to close the lid. I had never truly forgiven because offenses were never truly washed so they could heal. When the 16,000 movies incident had happened, I tried to forgive Phil and forget, believing the lie that time heals all wounds. Now, 18 years later, I was awakened to realize I had not forgiven Phil, nor forgotten how his betrayal made me feel. The memory of that day was still breeding anger and resentment and bitterness. Time heals all wounds was another lie. The truth was closer to time causes wounds to fester. My wounds had scabbed over, but underneath was a dangerous infection, continually eating at my soul, fueling my feverish anger. That day at Hope, God removed my scabs, and I could see the pus of unforgiveness had been hidden and poisoning me for so long. During the first evening, when Jenny had asked us, where are you? I'd seen myself only as a victim of Phil's betrayal, so that was where I had thought I was on the journey. Now I clearly saw I was actually in bondage to unforgiveness, and that bondage was threatening to destroy the rest of my life. Although I had thought forgiveness was primarily for Phil's benefit, now I saw the truth. Forgiveness was for me, too. Intellectually, I knew I needed to forgive Phil, but I was drowning in the whirlpool of emotions, and I didn't feel like forgiving him. The pain was powerful. In the past, my expression of forgiveness had occurred after I no longer felt offended. In other words, I based forgiveness on my feelings. God showed me that true healing forgiveness is based on faith, believing He provides a power to do what He commands, and that my feelings of forgiveness will follow, not precede my forgiveness of Phil. I had heard the Bible enough to know that Jesus commanded us to forgive, and now I knew that truly forgiving Phil and others was possible by faith, not feeling. 
To be freed, I needed to believe that Jesus had given me the power to forgive, even when I didn't feel like forgiving. My next thoughts were tentative as I pushed into this new unknown place in my thoughts and heart that Jesus was spreading out before me. He was holding out his hands to me, calling me by name. I slowly let the words trickle from my mouth that I didn't feel in my emotions, declaring what I knew to be true rather than how I felt. Lord Jesus, I know I can forgive Phil because you've forgiven me of so much. With that simple prayer, I asked God to help me forgive Phil by faith, not feeling. I was determined to figure out how to unlock God's power in me by faith to forgive Phil in the face of so much lingering pain. My thoughts were broken by Jenny's voice. Ladies, forgiveness does not mean forgetting. It means you choose to release into God's hands the one who's wounded you. It was suddenly so clear. I had never released Phil into God's hands. I had been fighting for control. I had wanted to be his continual judge, reigning above him in exacting payment and revenge. He had hurt me. He deserved to pay. That mindset and heart posture had pushed God aside and positioned myself in his seat. I had not trusted that he could deal with Phil without my help. I had seen Phil as my problem and myself as his judge, and I'd chosen to hold on to the offenses while simultaneously trying to hide them from my thoughts and pretend they had never occurred. Then it happened. Everything shifted in its rightful place when I moved from God's seat and relinquished to Him my hold on Phil. With a simple request, God, Phil is your problem. You deal with him. A weight was off my shoulders, cast directly onto God, where it should have been all along, and I was no longer the judge and jury and no longer the victim. I was the victor because of Christ. On our last night at Hope, we broke into small groups of three to four women for prayer. I was accustomed to praying at church, but this was different. Jenny said in her southern twang, Ladies, I know some of you are Pentecostals and Charismatics, and some of you are Baptists and Presbyterians. So for you Pentecostals, we're going to do some deliverance, and for you Baptists, we're going to break some strongholds. Whatever you call it, it's fine. You have an opportunity to experience the power of the Holy Spirit tonight. I had no clue what to expect. I hadn't been in this position before, and it felt strange to this former Baptist, Methodist, non-denominational girl. All I knew was that I was at the end of myself and the beginning of letting everything go by giving it all to God. I looked at all the pages I'd written, including the inventory of my wounds and shame, regrets, and mistakes, and there I saw it, written in blue ink. I had been the rebellious one toward God for most of my life. I had been apathetic toward His Word, His direction, His voice, and even His presence. Now I was in the presence of a holy God, seeing and feeling the weight of my own sin. And for the first time, I was bowing down before Him, confessing and agreeing with Jesus that I had chosen my way in the past instead of His. I had looked out for my own best interests, tried on my own to protect myself, and consequently denied Him access to my life, my heart, and my mind. I had betrayed His love for me. I was the adulterer. The very judgment I had leveled at Phil only a few days ago was now squarely pointed at me. After our small group leaders prayed, each of us renounced the work of the enemy in our lives and asked the Lord to take back from the enemy what he had stolen. In the middle of our desperate cries for help, Jesus was there with us in unconditional love, grace, and true healing forgiveness. I prayed an honest, no-holding-back, gut-level prayer before my Lord. I confessed all my junk, my regrets, and the ill decisions I had made. I renounced my rebellion, apathy, and critical spirit, fear and bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. And in that moment, I realized more fully how much Jesus loved me and the full weight I had been carrying for most of my life lifted. I felt free. 
The churning had ceased, all the dirty water had drained out, and the living water of Jesus was pouring over me and filling me. Around midnight, after about three hours of prayer, our group adjourned as new women in Christ. We walked lighter and taller. We now carried a radiance in our soul that we had not carried in. I remember Jenny's encouragement from earlier in the day. Ladies, if you want reconciliation with your husband, you have to take 100% responsibility for your portion of the problems in your marriage. If you think you're blameless, she pointed upward, you should get up on that cross with Jesus. Whether your part of the marriage problem is 2%, 10%, or 50%, you have to take full personal responsibility and ask God and your husband to forgive you. I had wondered what my percentage was. And that second evening at Hope, God made it clear to me. It wasn't only Phil who had messed up royally by living an immoral life. I had made my own choices to live in hypocrisy and idolatry, wearing a mask of the good Christian wife and mom, while underneath the surface, my heart was desolate, dry, hard ground, with no life and no growth. Yes, Phil was an adulterer and had chosen to do immoral things, but I too had chosen to betray God by putting him in the back seat instead of the driver's seat, not even allowing him in the front seat beside me. Until that evening, I had not relinquished the driving to him, but in essence had said, I got this. I can do it. I can make my own decisions. You just sit back there and watch me drive. I'll call you when I need you. I had traded the immense and powerful love of God for the love of myself and the world. I was an adulterer just like Phil, and my adultery had undoubtedly contributed at least to 10% toward the distance we had begun to experience in our marriage. Long before Phil's confession, we had both created a massive cavern between us. That evening, in Reflection and Revelation, I took 100% responsibility for my portion of the problem in our marriage. Phil had always been at the top of our family pecking order, where he had placed himself since the day we'd married. I knew it. My kids knew it. Everyone knew it. The moment he confessed, he had to let go of that top rung. And in my eyes, he had dropped far below me. And I had quickly grabbed that top spot. I agreed with Phil that he was the wretched bum for what he had done to me, our marriage, and our family. Now having seen my own sin through God's eyes, my own shortcomings, my own adultery, I had to be willing to loosen my grip on the top rung, let go and trust God to be my safety net. I slid down that ladder and found myself seated beside Phil, resting with him. He and I were now equal sinners, clinging only to Jesus in a like-minded faith that He was at work in our lives, our marriage, and our family. Our eyes were now fastened upward to God, seated in His rightful place in our hearts and lives, on the top rung. Seeing my sin made it impossible for me to continue holding Phil in judgment. Yes, the awful feelings were still there. I still felt the sting of his betrayal but my self-righteousness was gone. I could no longer demand revenge, retribution, or penalty on Phil because my Lord was not demanding those on me. I asked Jesus to let me participate in his forgiveness of Phil. God was the author of forgiveness, and any expectation I had that I could ever forgive Phil without God's power had been misplaced. That evening at Hope, I completely forgave Phil and released him to God and stood on God's forgiveness. From across the country, women had come to participate as complete strangers in a four days to Hope. Four days later, we had walked together through trauma, betrayal, wounds, heartaches, and ended up sharing the rawest part of who we were. We had found commonality and connection, which had created a sisterhood. We had found true hope. Maybe such honesty and openness, transparency, humility, and unity were what Jesus wanted all along for the body of Christ. It was not likely I'd see some of these women after that weekend, but the few I would see on occasion would be real about what they had faced and what God was doing in their lives, 
No masks, no hiding, no pretense, no shame. On the flight home, I realized I'd been running on fumes. My exhaustion pushed me deep into my seat. I was spent. There was nothing left of my energy, but I still needed to face what awaited me at home, and that would be far from a bed of roses. A slight uncertainty entered my heart. How do I walk this out? Not just on paper, but with Phil. I didn't want to go home and just kiss and make up, forgive and forget. No, I wanted a restart, a new beginning. I couldn't go back to what we thought was our normal, mediocre at best marriage. I had to draw a line in the sand and say, no more normal. I pulled into arrivals and saw Priscilla walking out of baggage claim. My heart sputtered as I wondered what type of greeting I'd receive. Maybe a hug? A small kiss? Maybe an I forgive you for everything, Phil, and a big kiss. I stopped at the curb and jumped out, looking for a signal from Priscilla that all was well. Hey, Priscilla, how are you doing? I'm so tired, she uttered wearily. This was a long weekend, no sleep. She handed me her luggage and turned to get into the car. No big or small kiss, not even a warm hello. Her demeanor suggested an all-is-well moment wasn't in my immediate future. On the way home, we shared chit-chat, mostly about whether the girls had been okay without her, sprinkled with a few tidbits of her weekend experience. It became clear that something amazing had happened, and while she still seemed hurt, the screaming and stomping of feet were now gone. I was thankful. When we arrived home, Priscilla quickly wheeled her luggage into the bedroom while our girls ran in shouting, Mommy! Mommy! She gave them big hugs and kisses, lingering while they enthusiastically embraced her and told her how much they'd missed her. Their interactions were warm. I watched from the sideline. I obviously wasn't part of Priscilla's eagerness to connect emotionally. She walked them to their rooms to say goodnight and returned to our room a few minutes later. Phil, I want to talk to you about our bedroom situation. You have two choices. You can sleep in the guest bedroom or... Pretend like we're sleeping in two twin beds. Priscilla's tone was matter-of-fact and unemotional as she motioned toward our king-size bed. You can stay on your side of the bed, and I'll stay on mine. No touching. She had obviously spent time thinking about how she felt. My hope for a small hug or kiss had been unrealistic. I'll take the imaginary twin bed, I replied, hoping that maybe one day we would at least rub feet, even if by accident. Priscilla nodded her acceptance, then turned and muttered, I'm going to take a shower and go to bed. She shut the bathroom door, making clear I wasn't invited to join her. I climbed into my pretend twin bed. Eventually, Priscilla emerged and joined me, but stayed far on her side. She said goodnight and turned off the light. That's it? No kiss? No tenderness? No nothing? I rolled over. Good night. At least I wasn't sleeping in the guest room. I woke up at 5 o'clock Monday and saw the kitchen light under our bedroom door. Oh, man, Phil's already up. I lay still for a few minutes, trying to figure out if I should get up and face him or stay put, hoping for more sleep. I decided to pray. Jesus, I know you've forgiven me for so much, and you've forgiven Phil. I want forgiveness towards him to be real. You commanded us to forgive, so it must be possible. Jesus, help me walk out my forgiveness toward him. That prayer was the first of many, asking God to help me walk out my forgiveness by faith. I got out of bed, picked up my robe, and walked to the kitchen. Phil was sitting at the kitchen table, reading his Bible and drinking a cup of coffee. His hair was spiked in all directions, and his eyes were red and sleepy, like he had a restless night. There was no good morning kiss or embrace, which had been our routine for many years. It was okay with me. I still wanted some physical distance. I pulled out a chair and sat down. We looked into each other's eyes, and I dropped mine to my tightly folded hands. Phil asked, how did you sleep? Better here than in Georgia. How about you? He shook his head, letting out a soft grunt. Do you want to walk this morning before the girls get up? Sure, I replied. Let me change and get my shoes. Over the next several days, Phil and I woke up early every morning to walk and talk together. It was the beginning of unpacking the things God had revealed to me. 
My apathetic spirit, my unforgiveness, and fear and anger I had carried for so long. I could tell my testimony was preparing Phil for his upcoming weekend at Four Days to Freedom, and my fears were slowly being replaced by faith that God was going to do something special inside Phil. If our marriage was going to heal, the healing had to start within each of us as individuals from the inside out. The next four days would be a defining moment for Phil, and I trusted God with Phil's heart. I had no idea God had more in mind than just changing Phil. He would change the trajectory of our entire family. Savage Questions for Reflection Number one, have you ever considered what percentage of the problems in your marriage is your responsibility? What is the percentage and why? Number two, are you holding on to any unforgiveness? Can you take a step of faith to ask God to help you forgive? Can you say, I forgive? Number three, What is the deepest pain in your marriage? Have you ever shared that pain with anyone? Number four, when was your closest encounter with God? What's standing in the way of receiving more from your relationship with Him? What can you do about the obstacle? This is Phil and Priscilla Fretwell. Thanks for listening. Our book, Savage Marriage, Triumph Over Betrayal and Sexual Addiction is now available on Amazon. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Savage Marriage Ministries. Also, join our Savage Marriage community at SavageMarriageMinistries.com. And remember, it's God who is at work in your savage adventure.